So let's start. Uh, welcome, first of all. Uh, thank you for being here. Time uh, talking to them, listening to what they've done, how they see their environment, challenges, things that they have deployed, what advantages do they see, and so on. And uh, prior to that, what I'll do is just set up the context of why we are talking about this software-based, software-defined world. And uh, we'll quickly then go over and, and introduce them, uh, get into the discussion. We'd also encourage you to ask questions. Uh, we want this to be a good interactive session. It is for you after all. I mean, we are sharing what we uh, see with our customer base. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, ask them. So my name is Amit. I am from the networking team at Dell, but I have spent enough time in the server and storage world that, you know, and I work closely with Dell servers and Dell storage team. I'm part of the product development team and product management, and uh, we build solutions. And in this day and age, as you heard, Michael, you know, it's about a lot of changes going on, and the data center is evolving, and we're going to cover some of that. So the context behind this as, you know, in the keynote, uh, Michael talked about it. Essentially, big data, cloud, security, uh, mobility, all of these things are changing the way people are thinking about IT, right? Uh, you can imagine an internet of things, right? That's yet another thing that is on the horizon. So all of these things, the data, your applications, everything is coming back into the data center. That becomes the central. And it's all about agility and flexibility and how do you get things done quickly, okay? Um, and, and every IT organization as we engage and as we talk to them, they are about how do I transform my IT organization, organizationally, technically, and the way I service my clients so that more and more employees, partners can connect to the network, they can get more information, they can do better analytics, whatever data you capture from your customers, partners, how do you take right decisions based on that, and then ultimately, whatever data you collect, you also want to secure. And, and we at Dell are organizing all our products, our strategy around these four pillars of being able to transform IT, being able to connect various people, devices, and so on, being able to inform, get analytics, and then securing. So those are the key themes, and most of the sessions that you are probably going to cover one topic or the other, okay? And truly, today we are at a crossroads where people have been doing IT in the past, and now with this new cloud, mobile-driven era, they are trying to figure out what is it that we should be doing. And that is where this software-defined, software-based approach comes into play. It's, the focus has shifted to being efficient, agile, and being flexible. And this, by the way, has already the journey began on this, on the compute front with server virtualization. It continues with containers. And, you know, there people have realized all these benefits. Uh, VMware as a company, you know, was built on this premise. So you can run, you can bring up servers with few clicks. You can consolidate number of servers into, you know, fewer physical servers. You could do all kinds of automation like D uh, HA, DRS, vMotion to be able to meet your needs. The same principles we find are showing up in the storage in the networking space as well. And that is why, as we engage with our customers, we find that this software-defined, software-based approach makes a lot of sense. And I'll give you a few examples, and I think we'll listen, we'll hear from our esteemed panel here of what they are doing and what areas are they seeing value. So first is similar to in the server world where they saw that they could run virtualization and that gave a lot of benefits in terms of consolidation and so on. We see on the networking front a same server-like model. You know, just like x86 servers, 
disaggregated CPU coming from one vendor, industry standard uh, servers coming, and then OS being disaggregated and apps and so on on top. We see that in networking. That's called open networking, where we have industry standard switches and OSs and so on. Storage. You know, traditionally, storage has been traditional array-based approaches. Now, with x86 industry standard servers, there is this paradigm of complementing the array-based solutions with scale-out storage, right? And, and we are, Dell working with our partners are offering that. Agility. I think one of the things that we find is customers would have different silos. They had server admins, network admins, storage admins. And a lot of the handshaking between these groups took time. Now you want to do that much more quickly. So you are driving these things through APIs, uh, through automation, and a lot of the movement is coming from the cloud web guys that have adopted DevOps. And that DevOps you know, movement is coming in, and that is providing agility to enterprises. Flexibility as well. You, you want your infrastructure to be very flexible. You know, just like today's server, x86 server, you can deploy a database, Oracle Rack. You can de deploy virtualization with VMware ESX. Same way, you want the, the networking topology to be set up. And whether you create a logical L2 segment, L3 segment, you want all of that to be independent of the hardware and the topology and all that. Similar notions are coming to storage as well. You know, how do I apply policies to a VM, storage policy, and get automation and so on? So those are various things we hear. And I think we'll hear specific examples of those from these esteemed customers of ours. Now, we just want to compare and contrast. You know, a lot of people have been deploying the traditional legacy-based approaches where things were tied back into the hardware or the ASIC. And that, we believed, was not ideal for you know, the fast, rapid pace of innovation that we are in. And often, tying back to hardware meant you had to upgrade uh, from one generation of uh, you know, your products to the next to get that innovation. Whereas in a software-based approach, you can get much faster innovation. You don't have to literally upgrade your hardware. You can upgrade the software. That is much, much easier. So these are much more non-disruptive. So just to compare and contrast on, on why people are looking at these software-based approaches. And I think compute-centric, and, and we are fortunate to be part of Dell where you know, the, the heritage has been on a compute, and we are extending that to storage and networking. So that's something that we see continuing. Our strategy is about being open, giving you flexibility as customers to be able to deploy different types of environments, to different types of workloads, applications. And we also try and validate and test a lot of this before we engage with you, so that you, know, you don't have to run into issues and bugs and so on. So that's our, our kind of strategy. Let me go ahead and introduce our esteemed panel of customers here. So uh, why don't we start from here, Mario, on the left. Maybe just a quick introduction and what you're involved with. Uh, sure. Sure. Um, so my name is Mario Vallejo. I'm with Verizon. Um, so my team does the design, build, and management of uh, compute data centers for our um, on-queue video service. So at these data centers, this is where we do the, the compute, the transcode, and storage of our linear and video on demand assets. And so it's just kind of similar to a, a cloud environment. Um, you know, the, the critical factors are really compute and, uh, and the storage capacity. Um, so my team also does WAN, DMZ, and a lot of uh, security operations work within our, in our data centers. Um, the other big piece that we do is um, we manage the R&D facilities. And this is a critical piece for us because this is a lot where we work with the application developers to, to validate that the application is going to work correctly on the network, is going to work correctly on the server platforms that they're being deployed to. And so we can run with them on the, these developers to understand, OK, how is it going to behave? Does it behave correctly? And from there, move it to our dev, QA, and to our prod environments. Great. Thank you. Um, Deal, do you want to go next? Hello. Okay. 
Sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm D.L. Daly, uh, Vice President IT CISO at Ancestry. Ancestry is the world's largest family history online resource. So we're basically a content aggregator. We have an enormous amount of content that we pull in to make it available to our customers for searching. Um, and since we're a web scale company, we also have to uh, concern ourselves with growing and deploying infrastructure fairly quickly. So one of the, the key drivers for us uh, in satisfying our customer needs and development agility needs was to build a platform that could uh, basically as an infrastructure, as a service, could be disconnected uh, and independent of software applications, both service-based applications <coughs> and uh, you know, cu our customer-facing applications. So uh, we were driven by you know, cost, keeping costs low, as many people would be, uh, being able to move quickly and to be able to scale out quickly as well. So, Thank you. Scott? Hi, my name is Scott Yost. My name is Scott Yost. I'm with the University or uh, Cornell University. We have a um, top five computer science department. I support a top ten engineering department. I support historically on both of those. I guess would be the easiest way to say that. And we do a lot of R and D, so compute, graphic cards, network research, um, really anything from uh, the sciences that the faculty might want to experiment on or do development on. We have to support that both in a production network and then really a test bed network at the same time. So as we moved into a new facility, I thought that we were going to go back into more of a legacy network, kind of count on our parent organization's network technology, and the faculty are like, well, Scott, we'd really like to do SDN OpenFlow in the new facility. So we have a, a complete deployment in our building of switches between all the data centers, between all the clients in that whole environment. And, and we built that out so we have parallel production and research running at the same time. So that our driver was a bit different in that higher ed space. Good luck. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Bob? Yeah, I'm Bob Orcus. I'm the CIO at Fairway Independent Mortgage. We're, we're kind of half-based in Dallas and half-based in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we're a top probably 15 mortgage company in the country. We do about 5,000 loans a month, which equates to about Ten, eleven billion dollars in loans a year. The company's got about twenty-nine hundred employees today. Um, we've got a fairly small IT organization. Uh, we have, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of three hundred branches around the country. So, you know, one of the challenges we have, uh, we started back in two thousand thirteen, is trying to protect all of your data when you come and apply for a mortgage with us. And uh, one of the big uh, steps forward that we started back in two thousand thirteen was trying to get to a virtualized desktop environment for our, for our folks out in our branches because they're all kind of independent to some extent. They like the entre entrepreneurship way of running the, their business. So it, it's, uh, it's something that is our first step into really trying to secure that. And Ahmad, I don't know how much you want to go into. Sure. The, the so, so absolutely. So I think you kind of now have a sense of you know, the spectrum of you know, different industries, different types of environments. And then I think what we'll try to do is uh, ask them to kind of articulate, you know, what kind of challenges they had in their current environment or prior environment and why they looked at these various software-based solutions, software-defined solutions. So maybe, Mario, you can start off. What kind of challenges did you have and what prompted you to look at, you know, one of these software-based, software-defined approaches? I'm sure, so similar to what Deal said, um, so we had top three issues that kind of were, always came up. Uh, the first one was agility. Um, we're really a, a DevOps organization. Um, our management had decided early if we were going to keep up with the market, um, we had to be able to make changes quickly and we had to be able to, to address features or functions and issues as they came up um, so that we can meet customer demand. Um, so that really pushed for us to bring a lot of uh, software developers, people that were used to doing open source, Linux administrators that were also used to be able to to grab things from the internet, pull down to, to solve our problems or add new features. Uh, so the original issue was they expected us from the network side to be able to 
to respond the same way. And uh, the truth is we weren't keeping up. Uh, we were still doing manual changes in all our switches and routers. Um, monitoring was limi limited to just SNMP or basic monitoring. And so, so we had a problem. We, we needed to be able to keep up and we couldn't. And so that's where we started looking at SDN to see if that could bring us the technical advantages in the platform to be able to address those issues. The, the other two issues are, were really security and cost. Um, from a security piece, it was with media assets, you have a lot of eyes looking at you and they want to make sure where is, my, where is that media and how are you protecting it? And so we needed a really good visibility into the network and to understand how the flows were going. And also, if we found an issue or a bug, we needed to be able to address that quickly, to be able to do a patch upgrade, an OS upgrade. And we had to do it in a way that wasn't going to interrupt our 24 by 7 service. And so this was other where we started looking at, OK, well, are there other OSs like Linux that could do that for us? So maybe you can then talk a little bit about you know, what approach did mm -hmm. you pursue and how did you come up with that solution? Um, so that'll kind of benefit some of these uh, people here. Sure. So, so we, when we started looking at SDN, when we first started looking, we just were actually kind of blown away by the amount of choices, and um, it really came down to, for at least for the hardware, you know, we had a partnership with Dell. Uh, for the OS, we wanted to leverage resources that we already had, and so, so in that case, we wanted to go with a Linux-based OS, with which we went with Cumulus. And the really reason was for us because we had a very strong Linux server team already. Uh, we also had um, a strong team that was doing our cloud development. And the Linux platform allowed us to use the same tools across the board. And so instead of us having to buy or have people for different silos, we could now leverage the tools and resources they were using for cloud server, and now we could use it on the network side. Um, from a patch upgrade, we already had tools that, and there's a lot out there for Linux, like Chef, Ansible, um, Puppet. Uh, we had a team that already had that expertise, and so we could leverage them and those tools that are already in our environment to be able to do quick updates and platforms. So, so not only were we able to really speed up our de deployments with the automation that that brought, um, but we were able to get better security visibility because now we could if we want to pull information, we could use the back-end APIs. We could use the same tools they were doing to just pull, not every five minutes like SNMP, but every couple seconds or when an incident happened and they could send a, a lot of data back to us. And so the last one I would just say is, was really cost. It was the other issue that we were facing. And our data center build out was going very fast this year and it continues to next year because a lot of the compute for our video side. And with the traditional model, the cost just grew exponential. And so uh, the other stand became another way for us to be able to drop that cost um, from a, both a CapEx and from a, an OpEx model. And so one for that initial investment we had to do, but for the OpEx, because now since we could leverage tools, we could leverage resources that were already in our environment, um, we didn't have to grow our team in that way that you usually have to do from a network when you increase your, your networks, um, but really from just we're focusing on the automation and the new skill sets that we brought into the team. Great. Thank you, Mario. And, and one of the things that, you know, as Mario articulated, we find similar to what happened in the compute industry. I mean, people who followed compute over the last 20, 30 years, you know, mainframes to client servers, servers being mostly Unix, RISC systems, Unspark, DEC Alpha, and then over the next decade, x86 scale out disaggregated, uh, we see a similar trend even in networking that, you know, there will be, and, and by the way, there will be a mix of customers, some that would prefer the integrated stack for various reasons, uh, just like in the compute, if you ran databases uh, up until, say, 10 years back, you'd still run them on a SunSpark deck, high-end, back-end uh, kind of server, but for all web and app tier, you would run on a virtualized environment. And, and we see that happening. You know, there'll be some that would like a vertically integrated stack with OS, some that would prefer a completely disaggregated model. And, and there are benefits, and as Mario articulated, you know, the new Linux tools, configuration, management, monitoring, all of those are available that you can leverage that you may already have, because you have lots of Linux uh, deployments. 
And so that is something that we see quite a bit in customers as well. Uh, so from there, maybe, Deal, you could articulate kind of the challenges you had and uh, what did you do, what approach did you pursue? Sure. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we were, try were trying to solve for agility. Uh, agility both at the application level to allow developers to develop code and release it uh, without having to be concerned or, or required to make or request infrastructure changes. And for the same reason, uh, uh, the IT folks are interested in being able to not have application dependencies so that we could make infrastructure changes without you know, having to uh, stop application development or cause outages. So the way we, you know, for the agility piece as well as for uh, scale out purposes, what we did was we began abstracting certain layers away from infrastructure. So the first thing we did was write a storage abstraction layer which basically made the application level independent of the storage device. So we were able to write a layer, uh, an interface, that just allowed through an API uh, the application to call for resources in storage, but it wouldn't know what platform or you know, what vendor or what that service was. So by doing that, we were able to then develop a, a very straightforward hyperscale out uh, storage model in which we use open source and o open systems technologies and migrate away from appliance-based software, for example, for storage, for example. Um, the other was writing a database abstraction layer so that we could do the same thing with the data layer. And by doing that, we made the databases or the data layer independent of what the database architecture was itself so that we could transition between different types of database technologies without interfering with the application tier. So those things helped the developers be more agile because they didn't have dependencies on infrastructure. And then the infrastructure teams could make changes at that level in, in, independently. Uh, we still coordinate, we still inform, right? We're all completely in sync on things, but it doesn't cause the whole business to stop in order to make one change or another. So much like Marius, our team, our application developers are in kind of a DevOps model where they do relatively continuous delivery. Uh, we have 40 teams of developers, and most are in a DevOps model. Some, some are not yet there. Uh, but, that, but by disconnecting uh, from infrastructure requirements, then folks can mostly release at will through, through that. Another benefit uh, in agility by disconnecting at the infrastructure level is that we could develop and put in place other compute models. So for example, we have our legacy system, which still hums along, but we've, we're building other versions of production that we are going to migrate our legacy to. One is a virtualized stack based on OpenStack, and then the next model that we are currently piloting is a uh, Docker container Kubernetes uh, mesosphere stack, uh, and all of it being done on the same exact Dell compute infrastructure uh, uh, basically w without making any changes. So uh, I can use infrastructure resources and move them around between platforms, uh, which is a great savings of, of, of capital and good optimization for us. Could you talk a little bit about the networking aspect also, how kind of you resolve sure. that? Yes, uh, we of course have a legacy network involved, uh, but in our piloting of our, all of our new environments, we are building out what we call a potted infrastructure of 13 racks in a row. Um, all of them, um, 11 compute racks, a network aggregation rack, and, and a storage virtualization rack. And on the, you know, for, for rack connectivity, we're using Dell Networking, formerly Force 10, uh, and that's bridging between our old network, and it's also taking us forward so that we can begin doing software-defined work at the top of rack and eventually we'll wind up going to pure SDN. Great, thank you. Uh, Scott, maybe, you know, we look at, we've looked at, you know, two enterprises, one service provider, one enterprise, now in a research, you know, place like Cornell. Help us understand, you know, challenges you had and what you did, what approach you took. Uh, right, so our, <coughs> me, our production environment is really the same as our research environment. So the faculty will have a myriad of projects going on at the same time that we're trying to run the production and, uh, systems. 
uh, we'll have compute, we'll have graphics, we'll, we'll have networking, we'll have some stuff I'm not even aware of what they're doing. Um, and, and we find out, like, okay, how can, how can we help protect them? How can we help make that work? So as we moved into the new facilities, about three years ago, we started the planning. It was really early. So we built a parallel set of OpenFlow instances on a set of Dell hardware. So across the entire um, data center, I think we have about 30 racks um, through the IDF to the client desktop. We installed the Dell 4810, 4820, which used to be a force uh, solution, force 10 solution. And as we deployed that, we also put an OFI, or OpenFlow instance, uh, across all four, or across all those switches at um, four layers. So we can give any research group or another group uh, an OpenFlow instance that they can put their own software-defined controller onto and their own systems in each rack. So again, each rack has got the Dell hardware, four instances. Uh, we have two groups defining their own controllers, building their own controllers, one uh, in an OS layer, another one more at a Java layer, and then we flip 600, 1,000, 2,000 virtual machines or physical machines back and forth between the different instances as the different researchers want to do things. And then we also take them back into production as they need that more in, in our production resources or services that we provide. So, so that's our environment. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, for folks who are not very familiar with OpenFlow, how many of you have heard of OpenFlow here? Okay, maybe half. So, you know, in this new paradigm of SDN, software-defined networking, there are multiple ways in which you can design your network, right? The, and, and we kind of at Dell look at it very comprehensively, and if you look at it holistically, there are the first approaches where you take a switch and you disaggregate the OS from the switch hardware. It's an industry standard switch, you can run any OS. That we believe is the first or one paradigm of SDN, where, you know, as Mario explained, he's using Dell switches like Dell servers, and then he's running, uh, say, uh, you know, ESX or RHEL. So in this case, he's running Cumulus. That's one approach. Another approach is, where in networking you have the data path and the control data plane and the control plane. Control plane is what determines where packets go, how it's routed, and OpenFlow is a protocol that was invented that came out of Stanford that is used to take the brains out into an entity called a controller. And that's what Scott is using with controllers where it controls the various switches. It's very analogous to if you've used a Catalyst 6500 or a Nexus 7000, a big chassis, you have the supervisory module, the soup, that is typically the control plane, and then all the line cards are all the data planes. So in this case, the soup now becomes a piece of software called a controller, and with that, you can control your network. So that's a second way in which we see customers doing SDN. There is a third way as well, which is where you set the plumbing up, you know, set the physical switches, and you run a layer of software called network virtualization. Some people call it NVO. And there we work with partners like VMware, NSX, and there are others where you can set the plumbing and then all your automation, agility, security, policies for apps are done through the software layer from the hypervisor and so on. So those are kind of the three ways as we see various customers look at software-defined networking. And we at Dell offer all of those with our industry standard switches. So thank you, Scott, for kind of highlighting that. Now, Bob, let's kind of switch to your, you are in the financial services business. Uh, help us kind of understand the challenges you had and what did you do about it for the solution? Sure. Um, yeah, as I was talking a little bit about before, we were we were headed down the path to uh, basically virtualize all our desktops for our branches out there who are now close to 2,900 people. And we had made the decision back in 2013 to actually purchase some converged hardware um, that, I'll leave the name quiet for the moment, but we purchased that fully expecting to um, roll out about half of our environment in the, in the first year, and then we would end up buying another 
uh, investment in that same technology a year later to finish our rollout. And so we got about a year into it, and um, we were a little slower rolling than we thought. We didn't need it quite as fast. We started looking um, at the Nutanix stuff. At the time, Dell didn't quite have their relationship in place with Nutanix, and I had a, an acquaintance from a prior life that was in at Nutanix. I'd worked with in the Citrix environment in a couple places before, and he was really excited about what the Nutanix product had to offer as it relates to software managing the entire environment. Um, so we looked hard at it. We brought the product in. We got a, a demo copy. We brought it in. We tested it with all the different applications we have, and we don't have a ton, but you know, the first thing we were looking at was the whole virtual environment, the whole Citrix. We're using Zen, Desktop, or Zen App at the, at the um, ultimate desktop level. We're looking at VDI, but we're really not there yet. Um, and so we, in our test, all the tests proved out extremely positive from a performance standpoint, somewhere in the neighborhood of 25% better performance up to 75%, depending on what, what different application we were testing. And so, you know, I also spent some time, I'd gone to Nutanix and met with their, their, uh, their folks out in California that do the support and talk to their whole support model. I'm a big numbers guy, so we did a, a total ROI on the product, trying to determine what we had spent on the other technology and what this would cost. And at the end of the day, the technology was cheaper up front. It was cheaper to run, uh, largely cheaper to run in that the annual maintenance and support of the product was nothing compared to the product we had in place. The complexity to upgrade that product um, is still a challenge to us today. We, we have not really upgraded the original product. We still have it. We've moved our almost all of our virtual environment off of that to the new Nutanix, but um, we've still not upgraded that product because of the complexity and the time associated with doing that. So what we saw, what we expected to see in the operating cost reduction is similar to what I think Mario was saying, we're a small shop. We don't have a lot of specialists in different areas, so we couldn't afford to bring in an expensive SAN or storage administrator to, to manage and, and brute force you know, how we all manage storage in the past as far as moving it around where it needed to be on a SSD, off SSD, all that kind of stuff. So what we saw is that there was very little care and feeding required with the product at all. It basically managed that for you. Um, it, you know, the test, everybody does the test. Once you fire it up, you go pull a drive out and see, see if anything happens. Obviously, in, in this case, in our test, it worked flawlessly. Put another drive back in. Within probably an hour, that drive was up to speed and everything else was, was moving just perfectly. So we basically then decided we were going to switch and we, we moved to the Nutanix environment about a year ago. We now have, and, and again, we were looking at the Dell product at the same time, but it, at, a year ago, Dell was just in final, final working out their agreement with Nutanix. Um, and we really couldn't wait a couple more months to make sure that that all got worked out. So we went forward with the, the Nutanix product, um, working with Dell all along. And so here we are a year later, we've got about 1,200 users up on our virtual environment, which is, like I said, getting near half of what we really want. What we're seeing is, you know, rack space size, huge difference in size requirements in the data center, huge difference in um, electrical consumption for the product. Uh, like I said, the staffing, I was able to now take three people that were kind of uh, jack of all trades and, and let them continue to be much more jack of all trades because the care and feeding and support of what we needed at the Nutanix level was so minimal on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, our network guy is actually the guy that probably knows the most about the, the Nutanix environment today, and obviously he didn't know anything about it coming in. Um, we've seen, you know, the, the performance be every good or better than we expected. We've had no, no downtime, and we made a second purchase uh, the middle of this year, mostly for our DR environment and to continue to scale. But we are um, extremely happy with the product to date, and it, it really solves that issue of trying to have to staff for multiple specialty environment for our technical group and allows us to continue to focus on things that bring more value to the business instead of just the day-to-day -day, um, keep it up and running. Great. Uh, thank you, Bob. How many of you people know the Nutanix or these software-defined kind of storage options? So just, I think a lot of you here do. I, I'll just recap. You know, clearly storage 
has been array based, you can expose NFS, SMB, you can have block with iSCSI, FC. That is the bulk of storage today, centralized, managed, optimized through a SAN fabric, whether it's IP or fiber channel. But with the advent of these web and cloud, uh, you know, big, large deployments, they are looking at server-based options. And Nutanix is an example of that kind of storage. You know, VMware has vSAN, it has Evo, uh, Rail, uh, there are other players. We also partner with Nexenta. Uh, Microsoft has software uh, kind of storage spaces, uh, very similar. Uh, you know, Red Hat has something called Ink Tank, and they offer Ceph. So there are various options, and one of the things that we at Dell do is we give a complete kind of portfolio of options to customers. It depends on your application's need. If you're running an OLTP, maybe you're comfortable with fiber channel and an array that is maybe an all flash array. But then if you're running other workloads, and depending on your comfort level, you will embrace one or the other. Um, any, any other? I was just going to say one other thing. The other nice the, the feature about the product is we can buy it in very small increments. We, you know, it, the other product that we had before is pretty much a huge stair step to purchase the next generation or the next level of investment in that product. But with the Nutanix or the Dell Tanix product, um, we can we can do it in much smaller increments as we grow, and, and we're growing very rapidly now. We've doubled in the three years I've been there, so it's really nice to be able to to stair step that that purchase instead of make a huge investment every year or two. Great. Uh, so we'll kind of now open it up for you know the audience to ask any questions. You've heard our panel members talk about you know challenges they had, what they did, what benefits. Are there questions that you want to ask? Sure. Great, great question. Did any, everyone hear that? So I'll just recap. You know, technical changes are easy. Organizational changes, skill set, bringing organization changing, that is a harder area. What did these guys do? So maybe Mario, could you tackle, could you answer that? Sure, so I think, sure, I think the first thing approach we took was um, we wanted to make sure that the technology was right for us. And once we, we started that path, um, we started really just bringing it out there to let people kind of start play with it, work with the, the technology. And what we soon found out was there were certain people that um, moved much quicker and took on those skills much quicker. And so I, what I didn't want to do was kind of force it upon everybody because um, every time we've done that type of work and change, what we usually find is we'll put everybody in a two-day class start the training, and out of that, nobody uses it, and only one person retains it. And so we wanted to take a, a slightly different approach, and so, so what we worked with the team was let people who actually wanted, in this case, for our, our side, was to learn the Linux, learn the programming, learn the automation, and some of the back-end tools, to take the lead. And what we soon found out was they moved much quicker, um, were able to take on the, the new skill set, understand the new technology, and what we found was, with some of the automation, we really didn't need everybody to be at the same skill level. Um, in our case, um, we were deploying new pods, new data centers that had about 27 new network devices, new switches. And with the automation, um, we were able to do that build with one person in about two days. In a legacy build, it was about two to three weeks for that manual effort. And when the other people within the team started to see just how powerful these tools were, just how much they could accomplish, and, and not even just with the, this new SDM, but really how could you use those tools, even on the legacy networks that we were using, um, that drove interest. That drove people to start playing with it. And then we could add the classes to then build that skill set. And then they could use that, that class and that knowledge right away on the deployments. And so, because otherwise, I, we, we just ran into the same thing. We just, everybody gets it and they forget it. And so we, we just didn't want to make the investment and not get value from it. Maybe maybe on Bob, your end, on the storage front, did you have a, 
storage admin earlier? Did you have different sets of people, and what what happened? No, we really had the jack of all trades kind of folks, and um, since we had a small group, we got them all involved in the process of doing the analysis, doing the comparison, doing the testing, and help them be engaged from the very beginning. So um, it was, to some extent, their their decision to make sure that it it really did what everything you know that it was advertised to do. Okay, uh, Bill, do you have any more insights of organizational? Yeah, cu culturally, in in our organization, uh, I think the team felt you know four years when I joined Ancestry that management basically made technology decisions and choices and told you know infrastructure teams what to do you know handed them user manuals and said you know just please go do this stuff uh, we changed that kind of culture upside down uh, maybe it benefit because i'm not primarily a technology person i'm not a systems engineer so my goal was to achieve certain business objectives both financial objectives, agility, and performance objectives for the systems that we have. So then I just challenged our storage teams, our compute teams, and network teams and said, look guys, we want to converge infrastructure. We want to leverage you know, open standard technologies and open source technologies if appropriate. You guys go, go figure out what the solution could and should be uh, as long as it meets these kind of business tests that we want to achieve. And I think that was kind of an unwrapping of a Christmas present for them. That was like, oh my gosh, now we get to, we get to, you know, play with toys and figure things out, you know, with a real be business benefit as a result. So I think we turned it from being them being told what to do to them owning the, the result. And I think you know, in partnership with Dell and open source technology partners and others. You know, I think they've we've built out a really, uh, you know, quite a world-class IAAS platform, and it's really the engineering and operations teams that came up with the solution. You know, they passed all of the business tests that we had for it, and they've, you know, they then they become the most enthusiastic supporters of it, right? When it's a homegrown kind of idea. So, so Scott, from a university kind of environment, did you see any, any kind of, or was it part of their culture? I think it was similar. Our challenge was that uh, the stakeholders wanted SDN in the new facility, you know, essentially to the desktop, to all the different resource computing solutions, and and they wanted to write their own controllers. Again, both an OS version of a controller, a, more of a Java-based version of a controller. So we started to struggle with what controller do we use, right? And we looked at several open source. And again, we have four instances running across all the different switches, and people can move around virtually on, on what their resource is, on which environment. And, and the team really pushed back. They're like, why are we doing this, right? We, we know how to do it in the old environment. And I, I don't know if it's quite legacy yet today, but we know how to do it there. And, and after about six months, it came to realization, let's just do it the way that we did before, but let's do it in SDN. Let's do it in the controller, right? And that was a, a major turning point for us because we were struggling on how do we go in, how do we program it, how do we do something different? And, and we found that if we did it the way that we had done it before, everybody was much more comfortable and then innately they started to learn the tools. So we actually have a commercial uh, controller on our production instance and we have a 1-800 number that the team members can call and have help. So uh, moving a virtual machine from one hypervisor to another hypervisor crashed. Right? We had no idea. We're looking at code, we're looking at code. The, the network technician engineer is not necessarily a programmer. Right? So re retooling those team members was also a challenge. Um, so again, we have a commercial product we use. We've replicated the old version of the network in the new environment and the team is getting much more comfortable. They're looking at how to do things differently. Um, we're doing training, but where, where do you land on? Again, the OS, the controller, the NVO, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a revolution, I guess is probably how I would say it. And I think, I think the, your question is very valid because when we engage with customers, and every customer is different, their environment is different, but I think as people have gone through various changes in the past, right, from mainframes to the RISC Unix systems to the now virtualized world, people, I think, have realized that the overall benefits outweigh the, the changes that they have to go through. And, and I think that is one of the things that, and I think 
that is a driver. And people who want to learn, who want to go embrace new technologies for the benefits, they are the ones that will do it earlier. So not everybody will do it at the same pace. That's what we, we, we see here. Uh, other question, there was another question, I think, somewhere there. Any, anyone else? That, that was a very good question. Yeah, the question was about the, the Nutanix investment we make and the, the, the trade-off between compute and storage and, and uh, I guess, balancing between that. Um, yeah, when we first got involved with Nutanix, they were storage-heavy and compute light, if you will. So we ended up purchasing more storage than we needed to ultimately get the compute that we needed for the, for the environment we were trying to put in place. You know, since then, a year later, there's been a lot of changes both from their product and I know the Dell product to allow you to mix and match the, the capability between compute and storage so that you can hone it in much better on what you ultimately have. We today have more storage than we need, but we haven't had any problem with you know, reallocating it around, but we, in today's environment, you, you can be much more selective on whatever your use case is for that particular group than you can buy accordingly all the way up to full SSD. Great. Other, anyone else? You sure. I'll just start and tackle maybe part of that. So our change management process hasn't changed regarding any changes to infrastructure, exactly the same processes. But we now have a team of um, coders and developers and scripters uh, that basically write software that now gets deployed in order to interlink um, you know, um, OpenStack components together or to link Cassandra databases together and all that. So something new for an, an IT group is that we're doing, you know, basically code releases to infrastructure, right, which is um, we have to do now unit testing, we have to do all, we have to bring in all the same rigor that we've always told the developers that they need, right, and now we have to, we have to kind of eat our own dog food in terms of f following the, the right disciplines so that we don't bring the house down when we're making an infrastructure change that's purely software based. So we, we've had to bring in and basically use the same advice that we've given development teams. I have Java coders and C-sharp coders and, and Perl, Ansible, scripters, right? And they all have to go by the same rules now as, as everyone else. But it, it's still leveraging the same kind of approval workflows and, and, and process, except they're using a dev process, kind of like a scrum management process in order to go through that. You're in the Might DevOps yeah. world, so. Yeah, I would say our experience was pretty similar uh, to Dio. So um, from the network space, you know, we were very used to, you know, here were your config changes that you were going to make on, you know, on that appliance or that, on that switcher router, and you'd only had to review those pieces. And it was very unique. It was this device, this device. And so you only had to worry about that island. Um, in our case, we also had to look at the DevOps model um, and understand their best practices and try to adopt those. And so in our case, uh, checking in code, um, be able to check out, pull a stream of that, that code, make your change, review it with the team the same way we would do it before, um, but understand that it was a much bigger impact. And um, with that, we, we, it definitely took some challenges to get to that approach. Um, I think there was, there was some initial some pushback of just wanting to go out there and make a change on device. You know, I think in our case, people were just used to getting to the CLI. And getting out of that behavior to actually look at your code was um, a learning path that it took us some time to get to. Um, but the nice thing was, because we were using automation, um, 
we could actually test this much easier than we could in the past. And so we could set up a dev environment, get our automation, set your code up, push it out to your dev environment, and you know, within 10, 15 minutes, you already knew how, how your change looked. And you could even do this in multiple environments before you actually rolled it out. And so, um, so I think with the automation also becomes an easier way to actually roll this out in a systematic way that you can take those bumps and learn all your mistakes there before you actually affect your production environment. Good. Any last questions? So maybe then we go around one last round of any lessons that you've learned, any last takeaways that you'd want to share with all the journey that you've been kind of through? Sure, I, I think that was kind of hit on is um, it is a, a different skill set. And so I, I think working on that skill set change now um, will bring huge dividends if you do want to go into the SDN environment. Um, for us, what we really found, it was a catalyst for change. Um, we knew we needed change. We knew we needed to change network engineers to, to not only looking at how you get the ones and zeros from point A to point B, um, but really understanding that they were really service engineers. They had to be responsible for the complete service. And so by them now taking, looking back and actually looking how developers develop their code, how you do code check-ins, how you can get a lot of the open source tools out there just in the environment to, to add better visibility into your network to, to solve quick problems has really been able to help us to understand how the server team works, how the application developers work, and allows for better communication. And so I think the end result is you, you get a win-win. It's not just the technical advantages of SDN, but you're really driving that skill set. And, and the reality, that's going to be your biggest win later on. Great. Yeah, I, I think the, also the cross-training and cultural implications are very, very significant. Uh, and somewhat, I didn't foresee all of them at the beginning. Uh, so, for example, bringing compute storage and network together into one group, uh, on both in engineering and then in operations, to sort of consider it as a converged infrastructure role, is then you have all three disciplines working together to solve a problem, and then you wind up with this effect of having, you know, your network engineers getting cross-trained into compute and your compute guys understanding what OpenStack Swift storage looks like on a server and how does it behave and how do you write a storage controller, for example. So there's lots of cross-disciplinary training and learning that goes on. And I think what this type of decision making does is it creates an environment of now continuous innovation because right, it's, it's once we've trained the folks into being able to innovate, they're not going to want to stop innovating. So once we get these two platforms in place, I know within 18 months, we're gonna, they're going to be saying, OK, so what's the next thing we have to invent? Right? And which is a, a wonderful thing for a group that's you know, historically managed you know, the present day you know, humdrum world of keeping everything available. Right? We still have all those rules around us about finance and availability and discipline and change control and all that. But in that same context, they can innovate every two or three years on new technologies because we now, they now understand how it happens and that it has to be done in a controlled and managed way, but they can do it. And, and I think that success breeds lots of enthusiasm within the group. That, that's a great point. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Scott, from your end, any key takeaways? I think we really found that the hardware is still so unstandard. It's a challenge to work from one type of vendor switch to another type of vendor switch. Um, what the attributes within the switch might be and how they use them, uh, how the controller, whatever, um, you know, the, the OS based, the, the controller based, or um, the NVO based solution, how it talks with them. I think that's a lesson. And then the retooling of team members, right? How you get. Uh, that sysadmin type who's not necessarily a programmer in your infrastructure team to start to program uh, a bit more is, again, the, the, the investment we have to make. Okay. Bob? Yeah, I don't, I don't think we had quite the, the challenge associated with the staff. You know, we, we didn't have to retrain a lot of folks. Uh, I, I think the, the lesson learned or the thing I would encourage everybody that they're interested in something like this is to you know, really take the time up front to, in, in our case, we were able to get a, a piece of the equipment 
on site to be able to actually load our apps on, load our things on, and test them and get and see what they were really going to perform. Uh, do your ROI, make sure it makes sense. Um, then the other thing is it's, it has allowed our group to free up to focus on more value added activities instead of worrying about you know managing all the storage and where it is and what it's doing. So I think we will continue to do those kinds of things that allow our group to be freed up to to invest in you know more higher level, higher value type uh, activities. Great, thank you. So let me uh, during the last kind of uh, you know couple of minutes that we have, just kind of wrap it and bring it all together. So from Dell's perspective, you know we sell a lot of the infrastructure that powers these software-defined, software-based data centers. Compute, uh, it's already down the path of being software-based driven through virtualization. Containers is driving it. We offer all the flavors of compute, rack, blade, modular, custom, all kinds of you know, infrastructure on the compute front, all x86. On the storage front, again, uh, we complement the traditional iSCSI fiber channel array solutions with a host, uh, you know, variety of partners that are all driving software defined scale out, pay as you grow approach that Bob talked about. That includes, as I said, VMware, Microsoft, Nutanix, KLT, we recently added them for Object Store, Nexenta, Ceph, and, 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 and as you go look at, you know, what suits your needs, it's best to understand some of them and many of them are here at the booths, so for you to talk to. From a networking perspective, you know, we've uh, embarked on this path of open networking, very similar to the x86 model, which is disaggregated. You have all range of OSs and applications. So we have uh, not only Cumulus uh, that we talked about, you know, uh, in Verizon's case, they're deploying Cumulus, but we have other partners. Um, we, we partner with uh, you know, various solution providers to be able to provide a solution. And then on top of that, we have a management framework called Active Systems Management, ASM, that can put the infrastructure together and then you, know, you can run whatever stack you want. You know, uh, your open stack, uh, you know, your VMware stack, or any of the stacks, we provide services. And then helping customers, we actually test our solutions together in things called blueprints. These are reference architectures. These are engineered solutions. Uh, you should spend some time, uh, you know, if you have interest, talk to the Dell folks at the booths, because they'll be able to give you kind of a whole rundown of various solutions that we offer. And, and we partner with, you know, all the major vendors uh, from a you know, VMware is one of our close partners from a networking, storage, and, and if the deal goes through, we'll be one family. Uh, we, we partner with uh, Red Hat for various solutions, particularly OpenStack, uh, Linux-based solutions, uh, and Microsoft is another. Satya talked about the cloud platform system. So the goal is that if you're running apps in Azure and you run Microsoft apps in, in your own premise, you can bridge between the two and we have various solutions, uh, small and large, so that you can move applications between your private cloud and public cloud Azure, which with cloud platform systems and the hybrid systems. So variety of solutions that are out there, uh, and they're all open, by the way. Uh, the key thing is, you as a customer, you have to figure out whether you want to embrace this new paradigm and embrace this new way of doing things, and I think do you value choice? I mean, as Dell, one of the things that we really proud, you know, have pride in ourselves is we have open ecosystems. You can run various flavors of OS apps and so on. And it's a very scalable kind of approach with kind of building blocks that are small and large. So that's kind of overall our approach of helping customers build software-defined or software-based systems. Uh, we uh, will you know, hang around here if you want to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with some of us here. Uh, but other than that, thank you so much. And, you know, there are a bunch of other sessions going on. If you're interested, you can attend some of those to learn more. So thanks again for being here. <laughs>